do 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 ooh. Do 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 do. This is Dina's vlog. Do 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 do. Ooh. We're gonna talk about making Christmas cards. Hello and welcome to the stream. <laughs> Don't you love looking at this graphic? Don't you love it? For those of you guys watching in the future, it's only gonna last a few moments. Don't worry. Shh, it's okay. It's okay. We're just waiting for people to get here during the live stream. Because for those of you who have your volumes turned on right now, I very rarely do these live streams for free to the public. What? These are usually a Patreon exclusive hov. But I was like, you know what? It's the holidays. Everyone should know how to make freaking their own Christmas cards on the cheap. <laughs> and if you're an artist like me, you definitely love giving your friends and family like gifts that you've made because it has so much more thought in it but it's also cheaper and i'm a fan of cheap so if you're a fan of cheap too let's make a christmas card together during today's live stream so excited dun, 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 dun. all right there's eight people watching i feel comfortable i'm showing my face it's happening what's up hi guys i'm dina from letter shop and i am back again with another wednesday live stream but today as i mentioned is free to the public that's what's up so what I'm going to be doing is talking about a new Christmas card that I have been making. And some of you guys have already kind of seen it a little bit <laughs> because I was kind of teasing it out on Instagram. Um, let me go ahead and switch some things up in my, <laughs> in my screen here. I had to lower my resolution from 1080 to 720. So I might be a little bit more pixelized than you're used to trying to get that live stream synced up, having a bunch of problems, super frustrating, but we shall prevail. If you're not uh, at this channel very often, I go, I release videos once or twice a week. I do a, a variety of, kind, of kinds of content, but if you're an artist or creative, this is the place for you, okay? I curse, fuck, I draw, I draw things. I. I've been a full-time freelancer for the past six years now, and I just made $10,000 last month, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. I've, I haven't, I haven't made that much money in one month in quite some time, unless I'm working with like really big clients. So, and that was all from product sales. So I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And I feel like I'm learning so much as I'm getting older and more experienced in this creative journey of mine. And I'm one of those people who likes to talk. I don't know if you've noticed that so far. Um, but I also like to share my experiences more importantly. Uh, so that way you can learn from my mistakes because I've made a lot of them. So definitely uh, check out some of the past videos, y'all. I do content on creativity, um, how to get freelance clients, social media advice, pretty much if artists struggle with it, I help you figure that shit out. But today we're doing something a little bit different. We're going back to my roots, which is hand lettering. I love me some letters. I make I have 23 different hand lettering workbooks out and available on my store right now. I've been making a new lettering workbook every month for the past two years. I thought I was only gonna do it for a few months and it turned out to be this awesome thing and I have all these different styles and I just released the latest one, number 23, which I'm calling Christmas Carol. And I'm excited to kind of show it to you guys. Here, let me pull it up in my uh, Photoshop situation uh, here. <laughs> So I can kind of show you um, here. I'll do the intro page. That'll be good. All right, let's switch screens as Photoshop opens and we can get this party started. So this is a blank page, but just to kind of give you an idea, this is some of the alphabet that we will be referencing during today's live stream. Um, I create their digital workbook. So for those of you guys watching in the future and you're very interested in learning the style, definitely check out the link below to join Patreon. Right when you sign up, you get two, not one, but two um, workbooks. You get this one, Christmas Carol, and last month, uh, which is called Big Mama. Uh, and then you also get access to my live streams that I do every week. That is normally a Patreon exclusive. Dina, you're repeating yourself, I know. Some cool things about this style that we're going to be going over today is, yes, it is a black letter style. It's mostly condensed, which means it's taller than it is wide. It's very angular. We're including things, um, <laughs> ball terminals at the end right here, uh, just to kind of look like jingle bells. Yes, they are intentional. This is considered a varied weight chiseled style because see how small and thin this diagonal line in the A is compared to how thick the lines are. Typically when you're drawing this kind of style, you're using a flat brush or a nib pen, but we're not doing calligraphy today. Calligraphy is more like handwriting and you're 
you're messing with the sensitivity and the pressure of how hard you're pressing down on the paper. But what I do is hand lettering, which is more illustrative, which means you can erase, which means you can just use anything around your house, crayons, pencils, Sharpies, whatever you got, you can make lettering with it. <laughs> um, so varied weight is pretty much just anytime you go down is thick. Anytime you go up is thin, just to kind of give you some basics to get started. Um, we do have a couple of guides here. I want to go over. So we have our cap height. This is the top of our capital letters. We have our X height, which is the top of our lowercase letters. The baseline, we're starting to get it, right? All right, the baseline, the bottom part of the letters. And then we have this little extra line here. This is where our descenders go. Descenders are pretty much what this G is right here. Anything that goes below the baseline is considered a descender. And then we have the word ascender, which is the opposite. Um, this is actually quite a long and, um, I think I'm trying to think of another word for long, but that's all I can think of. It's like it's a pretty long descender line. Uh, normally, my descender line would be like right about here. These guides are important, so when you're taking these letters and you're putting them into a phrase, uh, you can easily know where your your letters go, so that way you can make sure that first of all they're all the same height. <laughs> this is one of the biggest mistakes I see new lettering artists doing. They're just drawing for the sake of drawing, and they're not giving themselves guides. Uh, you really need to be thinking about what containers your letters need to go inside of before you just straight up just start, you know, making pretty script letters. And black letter, mind you, is one of the most difficult styles. It's so hard. Oh, my God, you're going to hate it. But when you get it right, it's oh so satisfying. I think you're going to enjoy it. I'm going to walk you through step by step and definitely consider buying my workbook. On Patreon, you get two workbooks for the price of one. But if you go on my shop, you only get one for the price of one. Yeah. So it's, you should do that if you want to. You know, no pressure. Um, so let me walk you through what I have prepared for you so far. And I'm going to kind of walk you through how I got there. Because I wanted to go ahead and do the majority of the work before the live stream started. Just so we wouldn't be here for six hours. <laughs> but I definitely want to walk you through it. Okay. So let's pull up the alphabet of this style, which I think I have somewhere. Draw two, look at this. Can you tell I just made a zine? It's like draw six, reference five, reference three, Jesus. Tis the season, da, 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 da. Here, I'll open up in my finder. Uh, thanks, what's up guys? Ready for your amazing lettering, Master Dina. I can read, thanks Jamie. I'm excited too. Normally it's so, I feel so awkward because normally these, these live streams are just for my patrons, as I've said like a thousand times already. Um, but normally we'll go ahead and we'll create an edited version that Rick does, my fiance and my employee. Um, he'll edit it down and just get to the nuts and bolts and then post that on YouTube. But for this one, we actually have so much work to do because we're going to be going on an adventure. We're going to Florida for Christmas. We're going to be taking a month off which is very well deserved. I normally work every single day and very rarely have a few hours off, let alone an entire day. So I think it'll be good for me. Um, so we have all this stuff we have to do. <laughs> so we don't have time for this video for to edit it because it's about Christmas and it's about making a Christmas card. So I definitely <laughs> wanted uh, this to be out as soon as possible, even though people watching the live stream are like, um, are you gonna get to talking about the Christmas card? Yes, I will, but it's a live stream. So just hold your, just hold, just shh, shh. Shh, just, just scrub through it later, future people. Present people, hang out with me. Get to see the, the Dina fully awkward. It's very exciting. Um, okay, Christmas Carol. Look, look, look. This is how many, this is how many zines we've done. Victorian, Black Letter, Circus, 70s, Western, Art Deco, Casual Sign Painters, Mono Weight Script, Art Nouveau, Engraved Serif, Savvy Swashes, Paint Brush, Romantic Script, more. Uh, Novel Luban, Funkster, Robotron, Celestial, Diamond Sans, Sans Serif, Gothic, Brush Script, uh, fancy flow. Uh, originally, Big Mama was called Big Beauty, and then we have Christmas Carol. So let's go ahead and pull up the alphabet just so we have that as reference. Here we go. And typically, when I do alphabets for these zines, I like to do all uppercase and lowercase letters, unless it's just like a really bold display type. There we go. Don't you love how you can like see my graphics card just like dying on, <laughs> it's on the inside? So here we have 50, technically 51 letters because the F works for both lowercase and capital letters. And I was like, all right, you guys just get one F. <laughs> it's very random. Um, so in order to draw the style, you have to draw it in a kind of weird way. 
where you have to go ahead and draw these parallel lines first because these are the longest, what they're called stems of a letter. The, the longest part is the stem, like usually a straight line of some kind. And you usually want to start here. So if we were drawing the end first, we would go ahead and just draw these outside lines first and then create these angular lines to connect them. And once you kind of get the, the hang of black lettering, it's really easy to create, but it's definitely intimidating. Most people, they start uh, drawing the letter from the left to the right of the letter. I think that's the incorrect way to draw. I really think you should draw the biggest part of the letter first, meaning the stem and then connecting them together. Mostly for, especially for like a condensed style like this, cause you'll make, you'll have all these inconsistencies. Like you'll have one really wide H and then a really skinny A for example, but I'll walk you through all that. All right. So let's talk about this Christmas card. Are we ready? It only took 13 minutes for, it, for us to get here. <laughs> I'm so excited. Okay, so I decided to draw the phrase, tis the season to chill the fuck out. So when it comes to lettering and phrases, typically lettering artists have the hardest time coming up with what to draw. Um, I definitely was that kind of illustrator for a really long time. I was only copying what other people were saying typically, but where you, the most important part of any artist's job is their perspective. You really need to think, what am I trying to say with this piece? What is the meaning behind the madness? You're not just trying to create a pretty picture. Yes, the picture should be pretty, of course, but if it doesn't make me feel anything, and especially if you didn't create it yourself, especially when it came, came to the actual content, I can tell. I can tell it's super fake and there's such a difference in terms of like, let's say engagement of you posting this piece on Instagram when you're just posting the same fucking like happy holidays, Merry Christmas as every other lettering artist, you are going to get overlooked. Yes, there, there, you know, there's the chance that piece could go viral. It could be extra detail and really impressive. But when you have literally hundreds, if not thousands of other people doing the exact kind of work, it's especially difficult to break through all that noise. So the, the easiest way that you can do that is coming up with your own original content. Now, the easiest way to do this is just to take a really common phrase and make it your own. Um, so if you just look up like common phrases or common motivational phrases for Christmas or the holidays or whatever holiday you celebrate, there's ways you can kind of twist them and bend them to your will, if you will. And so that way it comes, it just speaks more to what you're currently struggling with or what you feel or anything like that. So I actually ended up doing three of these yesterday. Three, uh, I don't, yeah. oh, there you go. The lighting is it just, like, so I wrote out these three phrases yesterday, wait for the lighting to come back, um, where I just, that's exactly what I did. I looked at uh, common motivational phrases and I just switched them. So I had three and I had my audience on Instagram vote. And this one was the winner. Tis the season to chill the fuck out. Um, so I did things instead of saying dreaming of a white Christmas, I wrote dreaming of a drama free Christmas. Did I mention I'm going to go see my mom <laughs> for the holidays? And we've never not once gotten into a fight and she's sober for the first time. So because she had to because of illnesses. Yay. And uh, I'm excited to spend some time with her when she can't drink or anything like that. And I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it might be our first drama free Christmas ever to get a little personal with you. Uh, so to me, that hits me a little bit harder instead of just saying dreaming of a white Christmas. And also it's in Florida. They ain't no white Christmases in Florida, right? Uh, the second phrase I came up with is um, instead of saying, all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth, right? Common phrase. I put, all I want for Christmas is to smoke weed and eat cookies. By the way, I smoke weed. Oh, that, that's the sound of 20 people not watching this video anymore. That's okay. And fuck off. Um, personally smoke weed and found lots of success in the cannabis industry personally. And also there's not a lot of really good cannabis art out there, guys. So if you smoke weed too. Make more cannabis art. People need it in their lives and, and it will get reshared. And then we came to our final phrase, which is tis the season to chill the fuck out. This is a reminder for me and everyone else out there. This is your time to take a break. Okay. I know work, work is always going to be there, man. Work's not going to go anywhere. Even if you get fired tomorrow, you're still, you still got more work to do to find a new job. Like it's endless. It's fucking endless. But Christmas and the holidays, especially here in the States, is the one excuse a year that you have to tell everyone to fuck off. You get to spend time with your family, your friends that are your new family. You get to fucking indulge in carbs and food and cookies and sweets. You get a plethora of cheesy holiday movies on Hallmark and many other channels. There's lots of, 
it's pretty much your time to put your feet up and not do anything and maybe gain 10 pounds because it's cold outside. And let's face it, ladies, there are no sweaters out there that make you look skinny. They only make you 10, 10 pounds fatter anyways. So you might as well just like look cute and have a little extra so that way you're not freezing your little tissue off. That's that's my advice. Can you tell I'm a doctor? No, I'm not. Anyways, <laughs> let's get to the lettering portion of <laughs> today's live stream. <laughs> Oh, Jamie. She's so funny. She's like, it's. I thought the same thing, going back to the chat, that the S that I drew was similar to the S everyone drew in the 90s, that no one knows where it came from. And also, you don't have, we have these things on the ends, called, they're called spurs. Um, you don't have to put them on your letters, but I think they look cool, especially if you like a little bit more of a badass touch to your work. Um, definitely highly recommend. Elemental Arts. You were too funny. I just discovered weed and it and it was for pain and I love it. Oh, I'm so glad that pain that pain could help you with your weed. That weed could help you with your pain. Jesus Christ. Not high or drunk, just super excited and somewhat awkward. Anyways, let's get started. Okay, so when we're trying to figure out the layout of this particular piece, you really want to figure out, okay, well, what's the best layout for this particular kind of style? So especially if you're going to be using this style for the entire phrase, you might as well make it really easy on yourself and make it just straightforward and don't make the line like curved or at an angle, just straight because black lettering is one of the hardest to read styles out there. So you don't want to do anything too complicated. And the more uh, kind of crazy your containers are, which are your guides, like you could put lettering in an arch, you can make a diagonal as an example, uh, the harder it is to read. So when you have a really complicated, a really um, kind of illustrative style like this, you want to kind of keep it pretty basic. So that's why this one was pretty straightforward. And I think if you guys use this style, you can literally copy this exact same <laughs> composition that I have right now. I always get like nervous burps when I live stream. I never burp this much. Haven't had soda today. It's just like, oh, there's people watching me on the internet. Burp. <laughs> so... One thing that is a kind of cool trick is I just want you to use in your own handwriting, right? And just try to, you know, do some thumbs on like, I personally love using like little post-its because it, force, it forces me to draw that tiny. For this one, I'm using my iPad Pro and Apple Pencil. I'm using a program called AstroPad in order to screen mirror Photoshop to my iPad. And it is connected to a, a cable just to make sure it legit works because sometimes it uh, doesn't. So what I did is I just started stacking my pieces and I knew that the words I wanted to emphasize were the actual words like seasons, chill and fuck out. Things like the, to, and the, those are tertiary words. They're like, they're not in first place words, they're second place words, right? So I made them actually a little bit smaller. So even though I'm using all the same style, a one way that you can make it just look a little bit more illustrative, a little more special is by playing with the sizing of that sentence to begin with. So anything that's like a not important word, like it's a, anything like that, you can make a little bit smaller. So that way you can kind of um, impact how people read the phrase in the first place. Because if I'm just reading this phrase, I have to figure out what the tone is of that phrase. So if I just read everything like a sentence, I go, tis the season to chill the fuck out. But if I emphasize the words that are bigger, tis the season to chill the fuck out, it totally changes the way that I say it. So I think that's a really good experiment when you're trying to think, because sometimes there might be other words that aren't the small words like we're talking about and you're not sure whether or not they should be smaller. Just say it. Go ahead, take the sentence that you're thinking about drawing, underline the words that you think are the most important and do a couple of practice runs, just saying it out loud like a weirdo. It will help you, I promise. Hopefully there's no one in your workspace that, so no one thinks you're talking to yourself. <laughs> but just say them out loud and with the tone of emphasizing those words and you'll know if it's the right fit for you. That's a really, really easy trick to figure out what uh, visual hierarchy will be, which is what we call it in the design community, visual hierarchy, which is the order in how we read the words. One thing you wanna be careful of here is you have to remember that people read from left to right, top to bottom. So sometimes I'll see lettering artists like, this, um, like for example, this the, I could have easily had this go to the chill, but it, people could have read it as tis the season to the chill fuck out. So I really had to make sure that two was higher and to the left of chill, and then the was below chill, but to the left of fuck, like um, 
chill the fuck out, right? So that's something to be careful of with this style. Allison's like, I struggle with so much with the composition. This is so helpful. Allison, this live stream is for you, okay? This is for you. Kisses. <laughs> so what I would go ahead and do is just straight up just write at these letters and then start to play with them. If you're working digitally, like using Procreate or something, I definitely want you to stay in this kind of rough sketch phase and notice that there are a few changes. So for the most part, this um, phrase is what we call title case. Sentence case is, you know, the first letter of a sentence capitalized like normal. And then we have title case which is all the important words are capitalized, like the, it's, a, aren't capitalized. And then you just have straight up um, the other one where the first letter of every word is capitalized. I can't think of it right now, but that's okay. So for this guy, I kind of just did my own thing. I go tis with a capital T, the, all lowercase, season, capital S. And this is important. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because you want to be figuring out the case of your lettering phrase before you even figure out what the official style is gonna be, how you're gonna decorate it, whatever. The more steps you take in this initial planning phase, the better off and actually the smoother and quicker you actually be able to finish this piece. Because for me to draw out this chicken scratch, essentially, took me like two minutes to do. And then if I'm making multiple thumbnails playing around really smallly, smallly, <laughs> I love, I love my use of grammar during these live streams and, and I'm drawing pretty small. I can create like 10 or 20 like thumbnails in like 30, 40 minutes. And that's pretty good. And that way I know, okay, what's the best composition? What's going to look the best. And so when it's time to actually do the production and add all the fun stuff, like the filigree and the icons and it, like, illustrated elements, drop caps, uh, fucking drop shadows, inlines, whatever. I feel like, okay, I have a really good base to start with. So for if you're using this style, again, check it out. Definitely become a patron if you want to learn how to draw it. Um, you want to be keeping in mind how you're writing it. So if you're, these are what I call the wireframe of the letters. Now, if you were doing something like script, you couldn't just write straight up like the same style, which would be considered a sans serif style. Um, you would still want it to be script. So for those of you who are wanting maybe to mix black lettering, like the style of black letter with script, you definitely want to make sure that the black letter looks more like this when you're doing a wireframe and the script is more like a mono weight script. It really helps you with like composition and to make sure everything doesn't have like any weird negative pockets of negative space or anything like that. Proper case, is that what it's called, Taylor? Taylor, is it called proper case? I love this phrase. Oh, I'm so glad you love it. Okay, so this is step one, which was the wireframe. From here, we wanna go ahead and do basic letters. So literally, that's my thumb, and those are my basic letters. So this is just straight up pretty much exactly what these letters are telling me how to draw them. Like no, not really doing any customizations. The only one customization I did was this lick from this H to the I, just because I knew I was probably gonna do that because it looked like a jingle bell. So I wanted to go ahead and do that. Um, pretty much you always want to be careful of the tittle. And I know we're all 12. Please laugh at it. Tittle. Did she just say titty? Kind of. So a tittle is a real vocabulary term referring to typography, which is talking about the little dot on top of the I's and the J's of an alphabet. So typically when you're looking for, you know, really interesting swashes or licks that are extending from your letters, you want to see if you can kind of tie any of them into a tittle because there's a lot of really cool opportunity for it. And you'll see in lettering, especially, that people don't even draw tittles, that they'll just draw like an extension or a cool crossbar or something like that and create a tittle out of that swash, which is really cool. <laughs> Taylor's like, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. I believe you. I don't, I'm, I could Google it. Okay, let's Google it. <laughs> I was like, I could Google it. All right, proper case. Let's all learn together. Proper case, in any text that is written with each of the first letters of every word being capitalized. Taylor for the win. Taylor for the win. Thank you, girl. I appreciate that. <laughs> LOL, tittle is the best word we've talked about in type class. Yeah, there's tittle. There's another really funny one. What is it? It's, it's not as good as tittle. That's definitely, that's, that's for sure. Okay, so there's a few things that I did here. Notice that I'm using a capital T in out and I'm using a capital L in chill. So even though like season, 
is proper case. In chill, I'm kind of doing a couple of random ones. I'm doing this because I saw that I had bigger pockets of negative space. So if I just had a normal L here in chill, I would have had this kind of awkward, this would have been a lot bigger of a negative space. So I decided to use a capital ones because it filled in more space. Same thing with the T. This initial T, do we have another example of a lowercase T? Oh, here we go. This lowercase T, it has a pretty high up crossbar, which is right here. So I would have had a bigger pocket of negative space. So I went ahead and I made it a capital T. So there's definitely ways you can do stuff like that. Um, initially, just within the style, like, oh, I'll just put in a couple random lowercase letters and all capital phrase or a couple of uppercase letters and all lowercase phrase. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But in this case, since black letter just looks kind of badass, no matter if it's capitalized or lowercase, lowercase, I could have a little bit more fun with it. But it's one of those things you have to try it and, you know, check your gut and see if it works for you. <laughs> so once we go ahead and we, we do this one, because we're, we're trying to figure out, okay, is this lockup going to work? And right now it kind of looks janky, right? We have these kind of weird pockets of negative space still, even with using those capital letters. So what I went ahead and did is I added a couple of um, additional licks to go ahead and um, fill up some of the space. So my two biggest um, pockets of space before was this space right here and this space right here. So when you have a T or any letter that has a crossbar, which is this line going across the stem, so this is the stem, this is the crossbar, you can kind of add loops and licks and fun little roly poly pieces um, to try to fill up that space. So that's what I did. And I did move around a couple letters. So you'll see, I went ahead and I added a lick off this T and this T. And I also made this K a lot bigger. Those are the biggest changes you can see. See, I had this little bit of negative space right here. By redrawing it and resizing it, now I just made that K bigger. And I did try to put a capital K in there and it didn't work. So I had to just make the lowercase K a little bit bigger. Ooh, fancy. Ooh, Jamie's impressed, you guys. I have to burp again. There we go. Okay. Oh, thanks, Holly. I'm glad you like it. This is how, these are the steps in which we need to take in order to make really beautiful typography. It's really just the planning phase of just chicken scratch. Then you just draw the lettering, especially if you're following my lettering workbooks. I often get the question, Dina, how come my work doesn't look like your work from the workbooks? It's like, those are just a wireframe of how those letters should look. It's your job as a creative, as a lettering artist to go ahead and customize the fuck out of those letters. Because again, I'm not trying to teach you how to draw a font. I'm just teaching you the basics of how to make that style look readable. So that way you have an easier time making those letters look consistent in a phrase, but it's still up to you to add your own flair to it. You know what I mean? Like it's still your art. And that's how I'm able to have like two over 200 students that learn from me on a monthly basis with these zines and their work to still doesn't look anything like mine because we're two different fucking people. So this is really this, the, the difference between like a basic bitch lettering artist, like someone who's more of like a noob, doesn't know what they're doing to someone who's like, all right, all right, I'm starting to figure this shit out. All right. <laughs> like I'm having more fun with it. And it's actually my favorite part of a lettering is adding all these customizations to the type. So with that, we still have some weird gaps, right? There's still some weird gaps going on. So I have this weird negative space, right? And then I still have this one right here. So this is the part where I start to add something called filigree. Boom, look at that, look at it. Before, after, before, and after, before, and after, after. Okay, so filigree is really awesome. You're, you're essentially just drawing a bunch of S's and then drawing extensions from those S's. So if I'm drawing filigree, I'm just going to create a new layer here. All I did was I started out with an S shape. Hold on. Do I have everything working? Okay. It just was delayed. So I'll draw like an S shape and then I will start drawing extensions off of that S to start filling up that space. That's pretty much how I do all of my extensions. And you can see it like, Right here, this is just an S. And I was like, oh, I still have this space here. Let me add a lick. And then I also forgot to uh, watermark my logo, which is on the bottom here. You can see it. Um, letter shop. I do this because my work is getting to the point where it's being shared a lot, which is awesome. But a lot of people are forgetting to credit me, which is a huge no-no. For the most part, 
people are dumb and they don't quite understand like reposting etiquette and that's okay, but it's definitely up to us as creatives to educate people. So that way they're not stealing your artwork without permission. Because we obviously want our artwork to be shared, especially if we're literally just creating for platforms like Instagram or Dribbble or Twitter or Facebook, is we want people to enjoy the art that we make. And so not every piece that we make is for a client or it's for a, pro you know, a project or product of some kind. So I do think it's very important to watermark your own pieces. This can be, you know, something as simple as me just writing your, your username or your physical name, if your name, your physical name, like your birth name, if your birth name is the same name as your username or whatever. Because some, what will happen, and this happens a lot, especially in the cannabis community, uh, like I mentioned before, since there's not a lot of cannabis art out there, is one person will repost my art and then they'll tag me. But then another person will repost my art because they saw the person that reposted me. And what they'll do is they'll credit the person who reposted me instead of me. And then that happens like 20 more times. And at the end of the day, people just don't know who made it. So if you don't watermark it, there's no way, you're making it so much easier for people to tag you and for you to get actual followers when people do go ahead and repost your work. And you would be surprised how many times I have seen my arc reposted and I had no idea. <laughs> and it was still watermarked. So it's like, you could only do so much. You know what I mean? Ah, <laughs> uh, thanks, Jamie. Damn, Dina Philly Reggae 1010. Thanks, girl. Um, Okay, so I'm, I'm done with that rant. So at this point, I could go ahead and I have this one, I still have this one weird pocket um, right here, but I decided I want to really cram a lot of detail into this piece. So what I want to go ahead and do is fill it with plants. And that's such an easy way to fill up a composition because if you have any kind of weird pockets in your work, uh, you can either fill it with a fil filigree like we talked about, or you can put iconography in there. And that's something that I do a lot in my own personal work. So if I pull up Instagram, for example, here, let's find a couple of samples to kind of get your brain moving. So sometimes I'll do something that's just straight up. I'll put stars everywhere. That's probably my go-to stars and dots. Um, like if I went ahead and I took away all of these stars and stuff, it would still be a balanced composition, but it would kind of feel like it was missing something, especially when I'm doing like stars, like in between the U and the R between strong. This one, it doesn't always have to be stars. Like this one is an example where I'm using papers or different illustration work to go, go ahead. This is probably my one of my favorite examples where I have, I, I this originally was just going to be a tattoo sheet of, of uh, different like icons <laughs> for, uh, for cannabis. And then I ended up just creating Weed Queen because Weed Queen was one of the pieces of the tattoo sheet and making it the bigger thing. So being able to fill it in with more icons, like like this, these fucking gummy bears, actually putting in some like quasi-realistic weed plants instead of just doing the leaves that are on weed plants, alarm clock, a pipe, and then going ahead and adding even more detail with smaller icons like stars and circles. So just using some of those examples from my own personal Instagram, like even if you look at the picture I posted today, like look how crammed that background is. Not only is it, a, you know, a tapestry full of different curse words, but then there's like all these kind of tattoo kind of icons going around it and then smaller icons behind it. I do this for a very specific reason. And that reason is I don't want you to see the mistakes. <laughs> The cleaner your illustration is and the simpler it is and the more negative space there is, the more people will notice all of the imperfections. But if you cram a lot of shit into a piece and like you don't have a lot of negative space, no one's going to notice that anything's wrong because there's so much there to distract the eye. This is something that I've been very aware of for years now, especially when I was like, let's say not very proud of my illustration skills at the time. I used it to hide a lot of my mistakes. So... I think it's kind of a really nice aesthetic, but I don't know if you personally like it, but it is something that I do. Um, so for this one, I thought it'd be cool to go ahead and use some more like Christmassy kind of leaves, right? So I went ahead and I had some inspiration. I went to Dribble. Dribble's probably one of my favorites. And just these, these few right here are the ones that I'm using as reference. These all come from other references. But when we think of Christmas, there's something about this leaf shape that you see everywhere. And then you have the little, I don't know what any of these things are called. What are they called? Help me. Uh, the, the cherries. I know they're not cherries, but the little, the little red bits on plants. <laughs> and then obviously filigree, right? Just doing like 
This is an example of mono weight filigree where the filigree is all the same weight. I'm doing varied weight filigree. And then I really like this sample because this is like jam packed with fucking plants and it's beautiful. Thank you very much, uh, Mandira Midha. You're very talented. Um, so I, I use this a lot for kind of reference for the different kind of plants I wanted to include in the background. And some other things I'm gonna be doing to the letters is I am gonna be putting some um, snow on some of them. So I pulled this up for reference to kind of remind me what snow looks like, even though I haven't seen it in a hot minute. And then also I just like drippy letters. So I do like the idea of maybe like half of the letter being frozen. Ooh, it's a GIF. I didn't know that. <laughs> I was like, get changed. <laughs> Holly berries. <laughs> is that really what it's called? Like little berries? Okay. So I, so like looking at this guy for reference, I went ahead and I added all a bunch of leaves along the outside. Now, doesn't that just complete this piece? So I did end up adding one piece of filigree right here, but it's mostly looks like plants. So this is a really nice way, especially plants and filigree. It's like they were meant to have babies together. Like they're gonna, they're gonna keep falling in love over and over and over again, right? So I went ahead and I just was like, okay, I'm gonna put leaves. I put some of these, these cool leaves in there. I put the holly berries in there um, just to kind of give it a little bit more oomph. And then I also have my um, tag here at the bottom and I ended up using a different kind of leaf in the center just so that way it would stand out on its own a little bit more and it wouldn't be too um, kind of shoved in there. So that's a lot of steps, right? But I wanted to break it down and then I even decided to put an inline in all of the bigger letters. So when I'm inking this, I just have a better idea of how I'm going to decorate it. So definitely with your still in the sketch phase, I definitely think it's a good idea to, to do some, what we like to call type studies. A type study is when you just draw like a single letter, almost like a drop cap kind of, where you're like, okay, I don't know how to decorate this A. So I'm gonna draw this A like four or five times. I mean, it makes sense to do it this way and just give it different kinds of inline graphics. Inline graphics are anything that goes on the inside of the letter and uh, Outline graphics are things like drop shadows or lines or anything like that that goes on the outside of the letter. So that way you're not having to do an entire piece, an entire phrase and see if that styling looks good. You can just focus on one letter at a time. Me, I pretty much knew this was gonna look good because I did a couple of experiments with a workbook, but I definitely wanted to put it in here during the sketch just to see if it would work out. Because these smaller letters, the and two and the second the, I want them to be completely filled in because again, this is one of the hardest to read styles. So the fact that I even made these letters, like the smaller letters, like 40% smaller, I don't feel comfortable adding any more decoration to them because it might make them even harder to read. With the bigger words like tis, season, chill, and fuck out, <laughs> fuck out by itself like just sounds like I'm saying it wrong like it, 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 my brain's like no it's fuck off but this would this would be a completely different phrase if it said tis the season to fuck off <laughs> I was like no chill the fuck out chill the fuck out um so I know it's gonna work a little bit better for me doesn't it so Taylor is coming in with the the inline makes a big difference yeah it definitely gives it more of that holiday feel and you already know I'm going to be using like red and green and holiday colors but I wanted to go ahead and walk you through how I landed here and I'm going to kind of just review it all over again for those of you who kind of got here later in the chat so this all started just with this using this style that's the newest hand lettering workbook for my patrons again if you're interested in learning this style step by step I do walk you through every single step making each letter both uppercase and lowercase in this workbook you can easily download it right now and print it out at home and you can print it out as many times as you want until you figure it out i show you how to trace it first then you're going to use reference by having the letter right next to you and then you know drawing it like you would normally and then the real challenge the real challenge is drawing it without reference because that's the entire point why i created these zines in the first place is i was personally fucking up the way I was drawing. I needed inspiration to draw and I would stare at things like Pinterest and Dribble and Instagram for like two hours trying to figure out what works, what doesn't, how can I, you know, steal like an artist and use those person's style with that person's color palette. And it was exhausting. So by the time I was actually ready to make something, I was burnt out. So I had a lot of projects I was I had planned to do that I felt good about making, but when it came to the actual making of it, I kind of sucked at it. Does this sound familiar? 
So I made this Lettering Adventures workbook series as an effort for me to personally figure out how to draw styles from memory versus needing inspiration to draw. Because now I've reached a point in my career, this is the 23rd zine that I've made in the past two years. So when I work for clients or if I do personal work or if I make products, I can just create from my brain. And this saves me so <laughs> much time. And I get often asked, Dina, how are you able to do all the things that you do for your business? And it's because of this, because I don't need to like trace fonts or I don't need to like use inspiration. I don't have to look at dribble and in order to make things. And now the biggest issue with finding reference to draw isn't necessarily like the time it takes and being burnt out by the end of it, but it's the comparison tra trap, right? That imposter syndrome, where like you're looking at all of these people who are so much better than you that you are dreaming that you could have the lives of. And so it's like, you're feeling like garbage. Your morale is down before you draw something. And then you're wondering why all your drawing is coming out shitty. It has a lot to do with your state of mind. And I think artists sometimes, they, they um, don't think so much about like being artsy, which I think is really funny. I, being an artist is very much about your empathy and your feelings and your perspective and your point of view. Just like when you're doing a passion project and you're really excited about it and you plow through it and time goes by so quickly, those are gonna be the best projects of your life. And this is also why things like client work will never be as good as your personal work because you have less creative freedom, you have uh, you know a time constraint. It's just, it's just a completely different <laughs> it's a completely different mindset. So definitely, I think as a lettering artist, you really need to start committing some of these styles to memory, especially some of your favorite styles that you use all the time, because a true artist can just draw from their own beautiful imagination which is so hard to do, but I promise it's so much easier once you just learn how to practice the right way and do deliberate practice, especially around like your three or four favorite styles that you like to try at home. So this is one of the styles you'd like to try. Definitely consider becoming a patron. You do get, again, two, <laughs> two zines for the price of one. And also you get access to all of my live stream lectures that I do every single week. Um, for those of you that are watching this in the future and now, uh, definitely consider checking out my past videos. Um, I recently did a video on how to curate your Instagram in order to land more followers and also how to attract clients using your website. So talking more about case studies and the marketing side of creativity. Cause that's often the things that we have the hardest time doing. Like how do I talk about myself? How do I sell people things without sounding like a used car salesman? All of the things. All right, now. Now we reach the point in our live stream where you guys get to ask me any question you want, any question in the world, where you can go ahead and copy and paste your username on Instagram. If you want me to go ahead and check out your feed on the gram gram, right? And give you a critique on your website, on a piece of work that you recently did, just your general Instagram aesthetic if you want. Maybe you have a specific question on creativity or freelance or getting clients or how much to charge or all the things. And as a reminder, even though it's not really a reminder because I haven't mentioned it, for those of you that are watching right now, those of you watching the future, you missed out. But for people right now, I have a giveaway going on right now for Instagram. I do a weekly giveaway every week. Uh, this one is to win a free hour of one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, where I can help you with, you know, social media, getting clients, making products, your portfolio, anything you really need. All you have to do to enter is go to my Instagram, please follow me. And, you know, don't be offended by my burping in your face. Uh, comment with one of your bigger struggles and then just go ahead and share this image to stories. Uh, right now I think about, it's really interesting because even though there's like 60 comments or something on here, only 30 people did the contest right. Um, which is funny. So... Something you, some of you guys might not know is you can easily share this image to stories. I can't show you on the desktop, but on your phone, you have the, here, I'll find it. Cause some people have been doing it wrong and I'm like, no, you're never going to win a giveaway. Um, you hit the little paper icon, icon button on the Instagram post. That guy right there, the little icon airplane button, you hit that. And then the very, very top, it says create a story. It says create a story with this post, you do that and then that's how you share it. Because that's how I look at it. Because I'm able to see who was able to share this post to their stories and that's how I choose a winner. So just a heads up. For those of you who are like, I would like to win a one hour free coaching. If you're gonna do it, you might as well do it the right way. So you might actually win. Huzzah!
Jamie, time lapses, how long should they be? <laughs> should they be a long clip sped up, multiple clips sped up, regular speed? It depends on what you're doing, I think. Um, if you're doing a time lapse, it depends on the platform. Like let's say Instagram, for example. If you're doing a time lapse on Instagram, you don't need to see, you don't need to see my Instagram as I talk about this. Um, you obviously want it to be less than a minute long, but you have to keep in mind people's attention spans are really bad. So if you're doing something that's more like calligraphy, where you're able to finish that piece quicker, I think just doing it at normal speed is preferred, especially if it's under one minute. But if it's like a longer project, I think you should just show the entire thing in less than a minute for Instagram. Just be careful. Some people really mess this up, especially like people that use Procreate where you just automatically get a time lapse that you can download showing your process, which is super cool about that platform. But what people do is they'll post the image of the time lapse, but they won't use the slide feature and include what the final image looks like. I think this is a huge mistake because sometimes I just don't have the patience, to be honest, to like finish watching it. And yes, I know the, Proc the Procreate default is it'll show it to you like the final for like two or three seconds and then it'll wash away and show you the process. But that isn't long enough. I want to like look at it and like enjoy it. So I actually do think it's a better idea for your first image to be the static final image and then the second image of the slider to be a time lapse because I can just, you can reel me in first with that beautiful final image and then you get what's called an engagement point. That's what I kind of like call it, like a point in the algorithm's favor that we're talking specifically for Instagram, where not only am I more likely to like read your caption, engage with you, comment, like, whatever, but also, which is really cool, definitely use the slide feature more often because I don't know if you've noticed this, um, when you're on Instagram and you see something in the slide feature, it'll show you that image once in the first slider, and then it'll show you that image again, but it'll show you the second image. So it's Instagram trying to be like, hey, 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 we know you like this content creator. Here's another thing that was in the same post, and it'll do that. So if you like 10 images in the slider, it'll do it 10 times. So it's like another chance for someone to engage with you. So that ended up being more advice about how to get more engagement on a time lapse, but I think it's helpful. <laughs> Mine is let me share the stories. I don't know why. That's really weird. I can't imagine why. That's really weird. So <laughs> Holly, I don't know why you wouldn't be able to have that functionality unless you like did something bad and Instagram is limiting your functionality. With the new iPad Pro and Pencil, are they worth upgrading to the new one or just stick with the first gen? Uh, Jared, I don't know. I haven't upgraded personally. Um, it's kind of messed up though because they... The, the most annoying thing about the old iPad is how you charge it. Like you have to charge it in here and it looks fucking dumb. And I have broken it. Like the, I've had my iPad for two years. The one time, the one time my iPad fell while it was charging, it broke my pencil. The first time it happened on carpet from like three feet up. God damn it. I hate Apple so much. They make such shitty products on purpose. So you have to buy them again. I hate it. <laughs> but and what sucks is the new iPad Pro... I mean, it doesn't suck, it's better. You know, it charges, it electronically snaps to it. But what the sucky part is you can only, when you buy the new iPad, you have to buy the new Apple Pencil and that's so frustrating. But I've heard really good things about it from friends. I personally am not going to be investing anymore in iPads. I'm just gonna go straight up tablet, like go to like a Cintiq or something like that, just because I've been having issues with Apple and I uh, switching slowly to Android and PC, but that's my personal preference just because I can't get behind a company that intentionally tries to rob people. Yeah, there's something about that. Like, I don't care how fancy and how big of a company you are. You're making products that literally stop working after two years. So I would be forced to buy a new phone or buy a new computer and you don't allow me to update it with better RAM or anything like that. And something about that just rubs me the wrong way. So I'm just kind of like slowly moving away from Apple, which really sucked because I have, I had an iPhone, an Apple watch, an iPad, two Apple uh, laptops in uh, iMac and an Apple router. So it's like, <laughs> so I have a jaded relationship with Apple right now. Uh, Allison says, I just have to say that you and audit for me. Oh, you did an audit for me last week and I've implemented a couple of the changes and it upped your engagement. Yay! Thanks for being so giving with your time and energy. Yeah, of course. I got you. <laughs> I feel the Apple pain. Such a frustrating company. That's the thing. Like, something that I've learned in like the last year or so is you don't have to do something just because everyone else is doing it. And that applies not only to like the technology you use and the supplies that you use, but the subject matters that you 
go towards for your art, um, the way that you present your work. I actually think it's better if we all just stopped following everyone on Instagram and just made for the sake of making. And we would create such more original content, so much more original work, original thinking. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes you just have to figure out shit for yourself. And I was born into the Apple business because I went to Full Sail University where they give you, they don't give you, I had to fucking pay for it, but that you have to buy like an Apple computer in order to do, you know, and they, it came fully loaded with all like the Adobe suite and all that stuff because I was studying graphic design. And I, so I was like, all right, Apple for life. That came off wrong. Sorry, guys. I didn't, I wasn't doing a Hail Hitler. I was doing like a for life hand gesture. <laughs> um, yeah, so Apple is just, they're robbing people and it's not okay. And I'm, I don't like it. Anyways, <laughs> preach, Jared says, is Twitch creative dead? Is it better to live stream on YouTube? Jamie, um, I don't know. I heard a lot of complaints from Twitch creative. I, for those of you who don't know, I started live streaming a lot on Twitch way, way before YouTube. I actually just started, this channel is only about a year old, to be honest. I've been streaming on Twitch for a couple of years and I would stream for like eight hours at a time. Uh, at first, the community was really great and inviting, but, you know, being a woman on a gaming platform that's overweight, oh, you know, you get, you get, you know, death threats and people saying horrible things to you. So I ended up getting off that platform. But my friends that are still on it are, are saying the same things. They're all like trying to go back to YouTube because it's really hard to teach people how to use Twitch that aren't familiar with that platform. And everyone knows what YouTube is. Like even fucking people's like grandmothers know what YouTube is. So it's like, it's a lot easier for them to figure out how to use it. So if you're going to be focusing on live streaming, I would recommend YouTube because it has the added benefit of SEO because who owns YouTube? Google, how do people find clients or products? Google. And you know what ranks more than articles and written content? Videos. So it's actually way better to create content that's searchable on a platform like YouTube because it'll help you with Google Analytics and SEO so you get more organic traffic to your videos and hopefully your website as well. So that's why I decided to go to YouTube. I was like, I get, I get fucking trolled way less on this platform. I'm like you always get trolled no matter what. It doesn't matter who you are, what you look like, what you make. You're going to get trolled. That's the internet. Um, but you know, I get better engagement. It helps me out with my website. Like if you type in hand lettering artist Portland, first result on the first page of Google. And it only took four years. <laughs> I've been thinking about switching to YouTube. Yeah, I like YouTube better. Yes, you don't get like the cool pop-up notifications and like the donation model and all that stuff, but there's other good stuff in there too. And I mean, they have subscriptions now. YouTube's trying. They're trying to compete with Twitch and Patreon and stuff. Like they're, they're going up here. They're, they're paddling. <laughs> like they're figuring out their shit. You know what I mean? I want to show this piece. All right. So feel free. I'm going to give you guys another we're live for another seven minutes. If you want to go ahead and figure out any other questions or if you would like anything critiqued, I'm here for you. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go. Ooh, someone just subscribed to me. Thank you, Anna Ball. You're nice. Um, so we started out with thumbs. Right. And for this style, we want them just to be straight. We don't want to use. Oh, I should probably show you the screen. <laughs> oh, someone else just subscribed. Karen Perry just subscribed. Thanks, Karen. You're cool. Um, <laughs> I hope I'm not that late. Yeah, Mario, you missed it. Only seven minutes left. That's OK. It's not you can totally watch this again if you want. All right. So quick review. We want to make sure that our letters are straight and not like on a curve, on an angle, because this black letter style is really, really hard to read because it's so um, fucking decorative. So you want to be careful. So I just did everything straight. You want to be careful of visual hierarchy, which is the order in people read words. So you want to be careful in placement. Just make sure people read left to right, top to bottom. Oh my God, the Allison C. Evans just subscribed. You guys are so nice. You guys are so nice. And Alina, if you want me to critique it, give me your, your username. Don't put a uh, URL because Instagram would be like, no. But if you give me your uh, URL, I'll, I'll totally critique you. Um, you wanna make this, like words that are less important, like the, it's, a, to, the, make them smaller. And you definitely, one thing I didn't mention is guides. Like this is a big mistake. I have these guides here on the left and right. Um, to make sure that my illustration is staying within it and it has a center focus. This is really important. You typically don't want to do anything like left aligned or right aligned for hand lettering. You normally want to be center aligned. This is very intentional because you want to keep the eye inside of your canvas. 
You don't want it to be leading to a pocket of negative space that makes you leave the canvas. This is really important for engagement. Uh, obviously for commercial work, you want to get more eyes on your, your work. Uh, you know, when clients are hiring you, they want you to hire you. They want you to make work that people are like for like a few seconds, you know, then we have our basic letters. This is just really not messing with ligatures or licks at this point. Just trying to figure out is my kerning consistent, which is the space between the letters is the weight of my letter staying consistent. Uh, do I need to make any changes with weird negative pockets of space or is it, you know, have a center focus? Does, do I read it correctly? All those things. Then from there, you want to go ahead and add licks. This is going to help you fill out any negative, uh, really big pockets of negative space. So I went ahead and filled this space with the T with these big licks. And then I went ahead and I added filigree. So by just doing essentially the letter S a bunch of times and then extending that S, Go ahead and did some filigree and then went ahead and added some plants so just to fill up the rest of the negative pockets went ahead and added some leaves and extensions off of my licks and added what we what i found out to be called holly berries <laughs> which sounds like ha halle berry which makes me giggle <laughs> uh, in order to have a consistent piece and then i went ahead and i added an inline just to kind of give it that Mwah! that magnifique that last little bit of detail you know mm, it's so good and tasty <laughs> so this is where i'm going to be at and then my next stage is going to be inking this i do everything digitally using my apple pencil and ipad pro and astropad in order to screen mirror photoshop to my ipad um i'll be inking this using a micron like brush and then I have my color palette that I use, which I use the same color palette every single time because it, that's the way to do it, people. I have like 30 colors that I choose from and I have rules where like my more saturated colors are in the foreground and like lighter pastel colors in the background. So I have optimum contrast for my lettering. <laughs> um, and I think having like taking the time to pick out a color palette, you know, that you use for the next quarter or the next year or something, it doesn't have to be forever, uh, is really such an easy way to have a consistent look and style for like your Instagram grid or your portfolio. Just a lot of people don't do it because they feel like they only have to use like the same five colors. Like I said, I have like 30 colors. Red Scorpio, thanks for being a subscriber on YouTube. Um, I think it's really, really helpful. So I definitely have like, and I have like three shades of green, three shades of red, like I have variety to choose from. All right, let's go ahead and wrap up today's live stream with a final critique for my friend Alina. All right, let's do it, my love. What is, what is your, what is your username? Okay, I copy, I paste it. I go in here and I find you. Okay, this you? Okay. Oh, look at your cute little aesthetic. So many white backgrounds. Okay. Holly is also asking any tips for doing lettering pieces with lots of word eight plus. Um, if you become a patron <laughs> for $7, you can look back at my previous post. And I did do a live lecture just this past month that talks about how to draw longer lettering phrases that are 20 plus words. So if you want that, Become a patron. And Holly, I think you were a patron. I don't know if you're a patron anymore, but if you're a $7 patron or higher, you get access to that video. Boom. Okay. Let's look at Alina's stuff. Okay. First things first. Let's look at her bio. Let's don't, don't even look at her work yet. Don't even look at it. Don't even look at, shh, don't look at it. Because if I should be able to know exactly what you offer just by reading your bio, this is how important it is. Okay. Graph designer, illustrator, specializing in book design, packaging, and hand lettering. You have your email, Society6, Rebel will hire me. Ooh, this looks like my, this looks similar to my bio. Elena. <laughs> um, okay, so I think specializing in book, I think you could just get rid of the word specializing in and just put book, design, packaging, and hand lettering and then have another bullet point emoji. Do chilling right here and I think it would look better because this looks kind of random how long this is and this is short. Another thing is I would recommend if you haven't already upgrading from a personal account to a business account for several reasons. The most important being one, you get analytics. Analytics are literally the only way <laughs> that you can know what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong on Instagram. Um, and in my class that I have right now, Instagram for artists, uh, which I, I, I opened up an additional spot. So if anybody wants to snag it, it's on my website. Um, <laughs> but the price did go up because you missed out. You missed out. I'm so sorry. 
Um, and also you don't have to, you know, waste your precious 150 characters writing your email. There's an email button you can just easily add, which is really nice. Okay. So other than that, I think this is pretty good. I know what you do. I know what services you offer and then I know what to expect on your link tree. So I think that's good. Now let's go ahead and look at your full Instagram. So you started doing this checkerboarding, which I think is awesome where it's like white background, color background, white background, color background. This is really like beautiful looking. Um, I can tell that you noticed maybe an issue once you had so many of these white backgrounds back to back. You really want to be careful of having what I like to call contrast, contrast pockets, um, which means like you have a, a bunch of images in your grid that all have like a similar background or they all have like the same white background or there's, there's not enough contrast between two images right next to each other. And you really want to be careful because how people are making a decision to follow you in the first place is they're going to glimpse like really quickly glimpse over your profile they're going to immediately go like this they're not even going to look at like the most beautiful things you just made they're going to be like doing like really fast scrolling which i think is so annoying but that's how people use instagram um so they're looking at your portfolio or your work here as a whole so it's really important that you make it as engaging and easy to scroll through as possible so it does actually matter what your grid looks like not just your images in your feed so but you're you're checkerboarding it so i love it I, I do feel like I'm missing you. Like the only time I see you is in your profile image and that kind of bums me out. I think it's so much easier, especially since you're looking for commercial work. I think it's important to include yourself, not only for your personal community on Instagram, but also potential consumers, because I'm much more likely to trust you if I like see that you're a real person. Like anybody can just, like anybody can just upload a random selfie of another person as their profile picture. But if I see like consistent images of you, like here's an image of you practicing or drawing, here's another image of you in front of a mural you made or something like that, then I'm like, oh, okay, this is a legit woman who is not gonna steal my money and it's not a scam. It's actually, I think that's actually a really important part to social media if you're trying to get hired by clients. And also, I just think everyone should have more lifestyle photography in your work. It really has honestly nothing to do with the fuck you look like. I don't care if you think you're pretty or you're ugly. People want to see your face. One of the most engaging images to this day over all of the cool things that we see on a daily basis, gifts, nudes, whatever is a smiling face. Seriously. So... I definitely think that we could be posting more of ourselves on social media because social media isn't a portfolio. It's a way for you to connect with people. And I feel like a lot of artists are not doing that correctly. And we're just talking at people instead of with them. And sometimes uh, lifestyle photos can really help bridge that gap. Just keep in mind that you don't post lifestyle photos for likes because that would be weird. You're not trying to be a model on Instagram. You're posting it to your really, really engaged followers that are excited to see you. That's why you do it. And also it's just easier to post more consistently when you spread out the kind of content that you offer. And just be like, boop, snap a little selfie, post it versus having to spend like 16 hours on a piece. I also feel like I'm missing process. Like, I think it's really important, again, from a client perspective to showcase process because I, you need to prove to me that you are not a printer, that what you do takes time and you are a valuable fucking artist. So by me saying like, hey, the first idea I have for a piece of art is normally not the best and it takes refinement and time and I have to scrap, you know, I have to fucking crumple up a lot of pieces of paper and I got to kill a lot of trees in order to make this shit happen. And there's a lot of stages, right, to creating really good lettering or really good illustration work. So you should showcase that. And also, you only get on average, if you're lucky, depending on how many followers you have, if you have like over a thousand, typically like 3%, that's 3%. You get 3% engagement. That's not a very good number. So I think it's important for us to be able to repeat the kind of content, like this pillow, for example, like show me the process sketch for it. Show me the final static image. Show me the static image with different colored backgrounds. Show me the static image mocked up on multiple products. Like you have this pillow here. Like you could use that same piece of art and repeat yourself because the majority of your fucking following probably didn't see it the first time or the second or third or fourth or fifth time that you posted it. This is why you'll see like more brands that like know what the fuck they're doing do that same practice. That's how they're able to post every single day, Monday through Friday. They're not made out of fucking magic. They just have a better strategy than you. So I think with that being said, making sure that you checkerboard, adding more process shots, more lifestyle photography, you'll be able to post more consistently. Now I'm going to judge you even more. <laughs> I'm going to judge your captions. Got to work with this fantastic fantastic person, her latest book, this thing. It was so much fun working on the layout and cover. Wow, that's not an interesting caption. This is a great piece of work that you have here, but nothing about this makes me like 
I'm going to start a conversation with you. Um, typically, people, artists make the mistake of writing captions that aren't very descriptive. They, it's kind of like, hey, mommy, look what I made today, which isn't very helpful. Instead, you want to go back to like basic storytelling, like the who, what, when, where, how. Why did you make this piece in the first place? What were the goals of the client? How did you accomplish those goals? Especially this is a portfolio piece and it's something that you got paid to do. Why not prove your worth to potential clients by talking about how you arrived at these design decisions and how you're a fucking professional instead of just being like, I made a cover of a book. Because when you do this, you're only going to get these kinds of fucking comments. This is great. I love this. Congrats. That, those are meaningless comments. You're just gonna get like thumbs up emojis. What you need to be doing is starting a conversation and giving people a reason to say, me too. I think that as well. That reminds me of this project that I did. This reminds me of this situation that I had in my life. And that's how you connect with people. You have to kind of get over this kind of like cosmetic, like I decided on feeding my inner beauty blogger and illustrated a few of my, few, my beauty favorites from the past month. Okay, and you tag them. I was like, okay, please tell me you tag them. But you didn't tell me why you like these beauty products. So like, I don't engage with this, especially if like, okay, I'm the kind of person who enjoys makeup and I want to, you know, see what, you know, someone I follow on Instagram kind of makeup that they like. I don't just care like what you use. I care about why you use it. Do you use the makeup revolution because you really enjoy the pigments and how they look on your skin and your skin color specifically? Do you like that nail polish because it's fast drying or it has some glitter in it? Do you like that lipstick because it stays for 12 hours and you can eat and not have to worry about reapplying it? Like from a, like even for, I know you're not trying to like sell these products. I'm just saying like in order to be able to create more interesting content. And then finally, I'll judge you on your hashtags. When you ask me for a critique, this is the kind of critique you guys get. First of all, you want to be using all 30 hashtags. It's kind of like if you only have 30 chances to win a coveted spot on the Explore page, you might as well use all 30 of them. And it does not matter whether or not it's in the first comment or in the description. It used to a couple algorithm versions ago, but it no longer uh, means anything. And you also want to be careful of using the same hashtags every single time. That is considered spammy behavior in the terms of Instagram. Actually, all platforms really don't like repeated content. Um, the same thing goes for your hashtags. So you really want to change them up and use more hashtags around the subject matter of what you're drawing versus the kind of art. Because if you're just using hashtags like typing, hang lettering, lettering, typography, type, first of all, those hashtags are way too popular. You're never going to rank for them because they've literally been used millions of times. But also if you do end up ranking for them, you're only going to attract an audience of other artists and other artists are probably not going to pay your bills. You want to be higher. You want to be trying to attract normal consumers, especially if you're making products. If you're making, if you're trying to get client work, then yes, that makes sense to use industry specific tags. But as someone who's looking for a hand lettering artist, I'm probably more interested in the kind of services you offer versus the fact that you do lettering because lettering is really popular right now. And it's just going to get more saturated. So what do you have that the other lettering artists don't have? And how can you prove your worth to me? Oh, that was so much talking. <laughs> that was so much talking. All right, I hope you enjoyed that critique and I hope you took feverish notes and I'd be happy to check it out again in like a month or so once you've uh, taken to heart some of my, uh, my tips, my hot tips. I'm just gonna have you guys look at my work more. Okay, Shanna's asking, how do you keep track of your hashtags? That's a really general question. Can you be more specific? Um, what I like to do for hashtags, and also I did an entire video last week on how to create a hashtag strategy um, that is available for patrons. So you should look at that video too. <laughs> and uh, hashtag strategy is one of the lectures in my social media class that's available right now. You just made an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, so you can make what's called hashtag groups, like have like six to 10 different hashtags that you know, revolve around the, you know, similar content that you make. Like, okay, when I do a lettering piece, I use these hashtags. When I, you know, do something that's based around social anxiety, I use these hashtags. I think that's fine. But for the most part, you really should be using different hashtags every single time that you post something. I know you guys are like, your heads are exploding. But if you use something like later, which is like a social media scheduler, it's really easy to come up with hashtags because they have a, here, I'll just show you. And I've showed this a couple times in the stream, but every time I do, there's always someone in the chat like, what the fuck? <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> this is the coolest thing ever. Oh, my throat hurts now. I haven't drank any coffee this whole time. I've just been talking and talking at your faces. 
because I love being your friend on the internet and I just want to hang out forever and ever. Later, we get to take so long to load, buddy. You're making yourself look bad, bro. <laughs> so as you can see here, um, I have these red highlight highlighted peats, peats, pieces. Uh, these are my best times to post. And I like to post everything like a couple weeks ahead of schedule. Oh yeah, look at that. Look at that, Dina. Look how prepared she is. So let's pull up this guy. Ooh, this is a potential, this is my, one of my weekly giveaways, guys. So, um, for hashtags, I already have a bunch of ones here, but let's say I just take one hashtag and I'm looking for some more. I hit this little button right here. This is hashtag suggestions. Copy and paste that hashtag interior lovers, because this is for interior design. It gives me a ton of different hashtag recommendations. And it also tells me how relevant these hashtags are to the original thing that I'm searching and it also shows the amount of searches. This is way faster. And you just like, you just click the ones that you want to add and hit insert and you're good. Um, this is way easier than trying to do it manually within the app. I highly recommend anyone who's trying to take Instagram more seriously to have some sort of social media scheduler, whether it's later or buffer or preview or anything like that. It just makes it so much easier because you it's so hard to write captions and pick hashtags in the in your fucking phone like this. It's so hard because of course your fucking captions are going to be like, I made this. It's cool. Sparkle emoji. Like, of course, so like you're like the pressure's on, man. Your anxiety is high up. But if you're just, you know, taking like Mondays to plan your social media scheduler and you're using your beautiful keyboard and your beautiful big screen computer, it's so much easier. And you're able to get more comfortable writing longer form content and really plan out your strategy and be like, I could actually make a thing about Christmas and post it on Christmas and not have to like freak out and like work until three in the morning just so I can get that piece posted by Christmas morning. Cause I've been there, I've done that. <laughs> so there you go, some more hot tips for you guys. Hey, later, sponsor Dina. I know. Can you guys, can you guys all blow up later on Twitter or Instagram and be like, please sponsor Dina? That'd be great. <laughs> I'd really appreciate it. Yeah, no more Insta mood, guys. Insta mood. Don't do it. And you also want to be careful with hashtags because some of them are banned. Like hashtag TGIF. That's a banned hashtag. So, and what banned means is if you use it, it's going to hurt your account. That's where it shadow, the word shadow ban came from. There's no such thing as shadow banning. It never existed. There was never a thing, but there is such, such things as called banned hashtags. If you used a banned hashtag that people used or abused it, usually within like a sexual context or a drug context of some kind, you can make any hashtag perverted, okay? Um, <laughs> where if you use it, it'll hurt your account and you'll start to see a decrease in engagement until you physically remove that hashtag or delete that post from your account. So it is worth using like a social media schedule like later or actually like putting your hashtags in to Instagram to make sure it doesn't say, hey, this, this hashtag has been removed because of violation of blah, 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 blah. Just be careful because like things like hashtag weed, for those of you who are in the cannabis industry like me, um, you gotta be really careful with weed hashtags because a lot of them are banned. So like, for example, hashtag weed, hashtag weed, if you look at recent posts, that's where you're going to go see, hey, this uh, hashtag has been removed because of X, Y, and Z. But the popular, like it shows you the popular pages, it'll still show up normally. So you have to look at the recent post in order to see that disclaimer. I don't know why Instagram has to make it so hard. Did you know that you can't copy and paste captions anymore from uh, Instagram? Nope. Did you know that <laughs> there's, they're restricting even more of our use in the, in the months to come? So exciting. So exciting, guys. All right, I'm done. Let's get out. It's time to get off the internet. <laughs> oh, as always, thank you guys so much for watching this live stream. I made it public. I hope you enjoyed it. All one hour and 16 minutes of it, uh, kind of going over my process for creating an amazing Christmas card. Um, definitely want you guys to be more creative with your copywriting, learn more of the steps, especially if you want to be using black letter, which I personally think is the perfect style for your Christmas card dwelling. Um, and just some of those tips in order to make the composition part of it so much easier. As always, please, please don't forget to subscribe as I broke my desk. Subscribe. Subscribe to my channel. Subscribe to my channel so I can be even more awkward with even more people on the internet. <laughs> um, also, please consider becoming a patron if you would like to get access to my monthly zines, zines and a 25% off coupon to everything in my store. 
including posters. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely consider being a patron at patreon.com slash letter shop. And please be my friend on the internet. Give me a follow on the gram. Hit all the buttons. Do all the things. And uh, I'll see you guys later. All right, guys. Thanks for being my friends on the internet. I'll see you later. Have a great day. Goodbye. Farewell. Good riddance.